Okay, I think we can start. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, this is uh, welcome to the first sem seminar of the Institute of Environmental Sciences seminar series. We are very excited and very happy to have Chalar Akçar with us today as the very first speaker of our seminar series. Uh, Chalar Akçay is a behavioral ecologist and a senior lecturer at the School of Life Sciences at the Anglia Ruskin University UK. Uh, Chalar Akçay held postdoc positions from Virginia Tech, Cornell, University of Washington, and then he received his PhD in animal behavior from the University of Washington and undergrad degrees from biology and psychology uh, from the Middle East Technical University. So his diverse background is quite exciting. Uh, currently he's working on the evolution and development of animal communications and works primarily with us. Uh, he actually collaborated a lot with Chalar, particularly on human cooperation and wildlife projects. But today he's gonna speak about uh, the effects of urban noise uh, on the communication system of birds. Now, what we're gonna do is uh, perhaps I should also say a few words about this seminar series because it's the first one with the very beginning. So the Institute of Environmental Sciences at Woolwich University, it's, it's a very interdisciplinary institution uh, where we research and teach different subjects such as uh, urban waste management, renewable energy, uh, water and wastewater treatment, environmental pollution and modeling, molecular ecology, microbial biotechnology, and socio-ecological sustainability. And uh, I think given these diverse backgrounds, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see that uh, our, our, our seminars will host scientists with different research interests from uh, both social and natural sciences working on ecology and environmental issues. So uh, we are very much looking forward to this very exciting talk by Chalar Akchai and further interesting talks in the future. Um, and here's the plan for today. Chalar Akchai will give a presentation of about uh, 30, 40 minutes, and then we will be opening up the floor for questions from our audience for about 20, 25 minutes, I would say. Uh, we can have a little bit longer if you need. And uh, we will be, as I said before, we are now recording, I think, yes, we are now recording uh, the seminar and we'll, we'll be putting this, also uploading the talk to the Institute YouTube channel. Um, thank you very much. And uh, the floor is yours, Chalar. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for the introduction, Pnar. Um, can you guys hear me well? Before we start? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you. It's great to be virtually here. Um, and it's really an honor to uh, be the first in the seminar series that I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, future seminars in the series as well. Uh, so thanks for inviting me uh, uh, to the Institute. And I, I, I do wish uh, it was in person, but uh, I guess it would be much harder for me to come if it was in person. So this is actually nice in that way. So I'm going to be talking about our uh, recent research on the effect of urban uh, noise in avian communication. Uh, as Pilar said, I'm uh, primarily a behavioral ecologist. I come from an uh, animal behavior degree um, or background, and my I didn't really uh, get interested in urban noise until uh, recently. Um, but um, uh, the, I, as I explained later, um, um, I'm you know, interested in the more kind of basic science questions, but uh, in fact, the, the anthropogenic uh, change that we're inflicting on the uh, earth actually uh, provides a really nice opportunity to ask those basic questions, while also at the same time uh, documenting our impact on the uh, environment as well. So uh, first I'm gonna just briefly uh, and gen very generally introduce uh, what uh, my area of research is. Um, and my area of research is basically animal communication in there. And in, in, the, in nature, we see all sorts of different uh, signals, all sorts of different types of communication from uh, uh, visual communication, like these mating signals that the birds of paradise give. I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor on the screen, but let me actually see if I can, how did you do this? No, that, that, sorry. If we can we see that. Okay, now you can see it. Okay, so these are the birds of paradise, um, the famous birds of paradise with their uh, stunning visual displays. Here we have visual, again, another visual signal, the fireflies uh, flashing lights, uh, which is again used as a mating signal. And uh, we have vocal signals like the bird song, which is what I'm gonna talk about. But of course, uh, vocal signals exist in almost every taxa, uh, like the primates. And uh, this is a midshipman fish that actually sings at underwater uh, to attract mates. And now you have tactile signals, uh, like the elephants greet.
three things, um, tactile signals in ants and, and, uh, and vibratory signals in, the, in spiders. So you have a lot of different modalities and different types of signals in nature. Okay? And the common thing about these things are uh, they are basically behavioral, physiological, or morphological characteristics that are fashioned or maintained by natural selection because they convey information to other organisms. And the, that's the critical thing. Uh, they convey information to other organisms. Okay, so uh, in the at the most basic um, level, you have one signaler and one receiver. Okay, and the signaler sends the signal, uh, the receiver receives it, and acts on it. Okay, and uh, the for the signal to be a signal, it has to carry some information. It has to reveal something about the signaler or something about the world to the receiver. Okay. Now this is actually very you know uh, you know straightforward for humans because you know when I talk to you and you know uh, give you information with my words uh, you kind of believe me because we I I have no intention of lying right uh, you kind of trust that I have no intention of lying but of course in the animal world that's not necessarily the case right uh, so how do animals actually know that uh, they are actually receiving reliable honest information and uh, by honest I mean uh, not kind of a moral connotation it's just reliable information um, truthful information. And there's actually, you know, if the interest of the receiver and the signaler aligns, like for instance, uh, in the case of uh, honeybee nest mates, then uh, there's actually a lot of incentive to signal honestly, and there's actually a lot of benefit to believe these uh, signals, so actually pay attention to these honest signals, okay? Uh, the honeybee uh, dance about the food source actually is the most famous example of this, okay? But of course, in many cases in the animal world, uh, the interest of two individuals do not align, okay? Uh, in that cases where uh, you might have the signaler actually have an incentive to signal dishonestly and send unreliable information and the receivers, if they believe that unreliable information, they may actually pay a cost to, uh, the, to uh, if they believe that uh, dishonest signal. And that is often the case in aggressive interactions, for instance, where uh, uh, intruder, for instance, may actually want to overstate their uh, ability to fight you. And if you believe that, then you might actually basically not go, get into a fight uh, that you would normally win, okay? And that might actually be costly in terms of either mating opportunities or uh, losing a territory. So that's the evolutionary puzzle of honesty and how honesty can be maintained, okay? And then there's a second uh, puzzle, uh, which is the ecological puzzle or ecological problem, and that's the ecological problem of transmission, okay? So whenever a signaler sends a signal to the receiver, like this uh, songbird uh, singing a song, it has to go through a medium uh, in order to reach the receiver, okay? And of course, this medium, um, and in the case of songbirds, it's gonna be air, right? This air is already uh, full with other stuff. Um, there's a lot of, uh, imp there's a lot of um, impediments like trees, uh, or maybe there's actually noise from uh, natural sources like uh, the surf uh, waves. Uh, it might be, a, there might be a noisy river nearby, et cetera. That's gonna interfere with the transmission of that signal. There's gonna be a lot of biotic sources of noise, uh, such as other songbirds, uh, other, other species like frogs or crickets or any insects, et cetera. And of course, increasingly, uh, as a result of our activities, there, there's anthropogenic noise in that, okay? All of these may actually impede the transmission of the signal from the signaler to the receiver. And that's gonna make the signaler or the receiver basically not necessarily able to, uh, receive the signal or even if it receives it may not be able to discriminate between different types of signal okay so uh, that actually uh, becomes an increasing problem uh, with the uh, urbanizations as well as urbanization as we see okay now uh, again the uh, it, despite the fact that there might be a difference of uh, this uh, in uh, uh, interest between the signaler and the receiver uh, in an aggressive situation, uh, it's still better for everyone to resolve a conflict with uh, signaling instead of physical fighting. Everybody would be worse off if they actually fought physically because they risk injury. So, so if they could talk it over, right, and talk it, you know, resolve it that way, that would be great. But of course, if they can't talk it over because of all this interference, then you have a problem. Um, so if the signals are ineffective, then uh, they might actually have to resort to actual physical aggression. Okay, so we're going to come back to that thing, uh, to that idea uh, later on in the talk. Uh, and the, of course, with uh, urban living, uh, this is actually becoming a more and more common scenario for a lot of animals that end up fi finding themselves in urban habitats. So urbanization is a very huge uh, and uncontrolled experiment that are being that's being carried on uh, worldwide in uh, every 
every uh, biome of the world. Um, something like 56% of uh, people right now are living in cities. Uh, that's predicted to be increasing to 70% by uh, 2050. And that leads to a lot of different things, uh, such as destruction and transformation of habitats, uh, bringing of in invasive species and novel pathog pathogens, etc. And of course, uh, all sorts of pollution. Uh, the acoustic pollution is very, uh, very, you know, salient to us. Uh, there's also chemical pollution, of course, and there's also visual pollution from the, all the lights that we put up there. Okay, and this is gonna change a lot of the uh, the life of the um, not only humans but also the animals, other animals that live in urban habitats. Okay, and I'm gonna focus uh, for the rest of the talk for mostly on the uh, role of acoustic noise. Okay, and this actually is a study, this actually is an area that has received a lot of attention in the last 20 uh, years or so. And here's a, uh, one of the earliest papers that actually uh, looked at uh, how acoustic noise actually affects animal communication. And <coughs> here we have uh, actually the, the Great Dead's song, sorry, oops. Here we have the songs of a great dead, which is actually a very common species found in uh, Eurasia, and that actually takes to uh, cities quite well. And this is the songs of, of the great dead, and this is the kind of well, a typical urban noise uh, profile here. Okay, notice that this is actually pretty low frequency. Most of the urban noise, uh, most of the anthropogenic noise, uh, comes from machines and you know uh, cars and internal combustion engines, etc. And uh, they tend to be very low frequency. And the so bird songs are actually pretty high frequency, but there's still actually a lot of um, uh, overlap. And even if there was no overlap, um, there's actually a kind of a, a well-known effect called Lombard effect that they, makes them sing louder. Okay? And uh, what Svek or Pete found in 2004 was that as the noise increased on, uh, in a city, the, song, the minimum frequencies of the songs that the great that sang actually increased linearly. Okay? So uh, great that's in the, long, the more noisy habitat, uh, actually saying with higher uh, minimum frequencies. Okay, that seems to be a uh, kind of attempt to escape from uh, masking influence of this low frequency noise. Okay, now uh, shifting frequencies is just one way of uh, uh, one solution to uh, escape this noise. One uh, another solution, as I said, is the Lombard effect, which is basically just singing louder, uh, vocalizing louder. And Lombard effect, by, by the way, is a pretty universal effect uh, that is also found in humans. When we go into a noisy habitat, uh, when we start, you know, when we find ourselves in a noisy cafe, for instance, we start instinctively singing or not singing, uh, speaking loudly uh, or louder, okay? Um, shifting noise frequencies uh, from the noisy frequencies, vocalizing more uh, in, a, in, in the sense that repeating words more uh, is actually uh, another strategy. And of course, we can also switch to a different model or the animals can switch to a different modality if they're able, if they have signals in that modality. So if they're, if the acoustic modality is too noisy, they might be able to switch to a visual modality. Now these changes may occur through either individual plasticity or flexibility, such that you know an individual might actually be able to modify their vocal behavior uh, when they encounter noise, or they, there might be actually longer term processes that selects for more efficient uh, signals at the population level. Okay, and this is actually one of the major questions that we're gonna we're, we still don't know the answer to. Despite all these potential adjustments, uh, communication may still break down. And if communication still break, breaks down, then the animals might actually end up having to resort to other means uh, to uh, resolve their differences. Okay? And in the case of aggressive signals, that might actually lead to more aggression. Okay? So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about a few uh, question, research questions um, that I'm interested in. Uh, the first question is, are signals still honest in urban habitats? And then the, I'm gonna talk about uh, what are the consequences of less effective signals? Uh, does noise cause increased aggression when communication breaks down and whether animals switch to uh, other modalities when the acoustic modality is noisy? And as I said, uh, just to give a background, I am I'm I come from this from a more basic uh, kind of evolution biology perspective, and I was already interested in uh, evolution of other signal quite a bit, and um, I realized you know uh, during my PhD that these um, urbanization and the anthropogenic noise is actually a kind of very interesting test of uh, testing how these animal communication systems might actually respond to this rapid environmental change that is uh, induced by humans. So it's essentially a co uncontrolled, but interesting uh, uh, experiments that we're doing with uh, urbanization. 
So the first thing, uh, the first study that I'm going to talk about is uh, a study that I did with uh, Song Sparrows, uh, which is a North American song, but this is, uh, this is a study that I did at the end of my uh, last postdoc um, at Virginia Tech. The Song Sparrow is the, uh, what we would call the little brown job. Uh, it's very, it looks very kind of you know, brownish and not very remarkable, but it actually has a very uh, remarkable song. Only the males sing in the species, and they actually defend all these all these all-to-purpose territories uh, uh, in some spe in some uh, cases year-round. Okay, this is what their song song looks like, and I realize that I might have to share my uh, sound here. Uh, bear with me. Here we go. Okay, this is what their song looked like. This is a spectrogram. Uh, on the y-axis, we have frequency. On the x-axis, we have time. This is basically a visual representation of the spectrogram. And this is how we actually analyze uh, these uh, vocalizations. So, so, you know, it's to me, it actually doesn't really sound very pretty, but actually, it's actually very complex. Okay, um, in that sense, it's very, very nice, very beautiful. And uh, of course, to a song sparrow, this is actually this turns out to be a you know territorial signal, and it's not necessarily a signal of pretty you know beauty or anything like that. It's actually basically means that this is my territory. Okay, now. Um, this is the loud song. This is the kind of territorial broadcast song that they sing normally. But in close range interactions, they actually have other uh, signals that they use as aggressive signals. In particular, they have two honest aggressive signals, soft songs and wing waves. And uh, I'm actually going to uh, show you a video of those uh, if I can, if I manage this. So I, and this video actually show, is going to also uh, kind of introduce how we do these studies in the field. Uh, so we oftentimes we have a speaker. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Oh. Wait, what happened? Okay, sorry. I lost my screen. Wait. There we go. Can you see my screen here? Okay, good. And uh, I hope you can also hear the song, uh, uh, the the playback. So we have a we have a speaker here. Okay. And uh, that basically plays the bird song. And for good measure, we also put a taxidermic mount of a bird, dead bird essentially, dead stuffed bird onto the branch, which basically gives them a target uh, to basically focus. Okay. And when we play the uh, song from the speaker, you know, these are so these songbirds are not very clever. Uh, they actually think that there's an intruder there. Okay. So we can actually simulate the, the presence of an intruder, a con specific intruder, and then measure their responses. And uh, the differences in different responses depending on the condition. So here we have the playback. playback. This is the real bird. Oh, that was the playback song. Wing wave and quiet song. He just sang this very he's quiet song and the wing wave. So he's going to come over here and do that again quiet. in a minute. Wing wave and, quiet song. and I want you to notice the difference in volume between the playback and the song playback. that he sings. Quiet. Wing wave and soft song and wing wave and another one. Playback. Right. Okay, so I hope I hope I hope you could hear it. And um, so there's a kind of the soft songs are quiet in amplitude and low in amplitude, and uh, they're often accompanied by this visual display called wing wave that they basically just you know flutter their wing without taking off. And uh, they do that around, you know, flying around the uh, targets uh, multiple times. And, you know, as you continue to challenge him with the playback and, you know, this dead stuff bird is stuck there, right? So they are not moving, they're not backing off. So this is what happens afterwards. You can still see it, right? So this is a, obviously this is a dead bird, this is the live bird. That was a quiet song. And oh. <laughs> and that's it. Okay. So I don't know. It's yeah, that's kind of my job. I piss off birds, uh, pretty much. Uh most for research. I, I occasionally piss off humans too, but not for research. Okay, so um so through this experiment, we can actually see whether soft song actually reliably predicts attack, right? So you can actually, you know, test a lot of uh, 
different uh, subjects, and then uh, you can actually plot whether uh, they attacked or not, and how many soft songs they gave, for instance, before attacking. And as, as it turns out, uh, the attackers actually give a lot more soft songs than non-attackers, so soft song actually reliably predicts attack. Now, uh, this is kind of really cool. And, uh, and in fact, soft song, by the way, has been found to be a reliable signal uh, in other species as well. But it's really odd because the defining feature of the soft song is the low amplitude, okay? And um, this might actually make this uh, uh, soft songs actually very prone to urban noise, right? Uh, all the noise that we have in the urban habitats, okay? Because in the, these low amplitude songs means that they actually will not, wouldn't transmit very far in noise. Okay, they will be much more susceptible to interference from noise. So is that a, uh, is, does that doom these soft songs, uh, which has been the, basically the most reliable signal that has been found in songbirds as an aggressive signal? Does, is, is the signal actually doomed in urban habitats? So we wondered about that. And then uh, we also wondered, because I have this visual, so, visual signal, uh, wing waves, we actually wondered whether they actually, if the soft song is doomed, do they actually switch to signaling more via wing waves? So what we did was we tested both rural and urban song sparrows in and around Blacksburg, Virginia, which is where Virginia Tech was located when I was, where I was doing my PhD or postdoctoral work uh, in 2017. And this is the kind of habitats that we worked on. This is the Virginia Tech campus. It's actually a pretty green campus, uh, but it's very, there is a lot of noise still, and there's a lot of uh, foot traffic and vehicle traffic as well. And this is one of our rural sites, uh, Canton Farm, which, is, which looks very pretty. And it's actually, there's some, you know, uh, agriculture equipment there, but it's much less noisy. Okay, this was uh, this work was done with uh, Kendra Sewell and Michelle Beck uh, at Virginia Tech, and this just shows you that the difference in ambient noise between the urban and rural habitats. Urban habitats are much more noisier than the rural habitats. Uh, the rural habitats were plenty noisy, in fact, in this in this experiment, but the urban habitats were still uh, quite noisy. So we predicted that if soft songs are less useful uh, in urban habitats, then uh, we expect the urban birds to sing fewer soft songs, but more lo loud songs. And they should shift their signaling effort to visual modality, which is the uh, multimodal shift hypothesis. And if communication is still ineffective, they may have to increase their approach behavior and does aggression. And that's because of approaching during an aggressive interaction to your opponent basically increases the risk of escalation. Everything can kind of uh, get out of hand very quickly if you actually approach each other during an aggressive interaction. Okay, so it's actually uh, better to stay away and signal if you can. So what we found was that, uh, first of all, uh, urban birds were indeed more aggressive than the rural birds. Urban song squares were a approaching the speaker uh, and staying close to the speaker within one meter uh, more than the rural birds. This is the proportion of the trial that they stayed within one meter. Okay? And as you can see, there's a huge amount of variation, but uh, on average, the urban birds are more aggressive than the rural birds. Okay? They also attack the, this taxidermic mount, the, the, the stuffed bird, uh, far more often in the urban habitats than the rural habitats. Only 9% of or so attacked in the rural habitats, uh, almost 40% actually attacked in the uh, urban habitats. Okay, so urban birds are in fact uh, more aggressive, and they approach the speaker more. Uh, but what we found was uh, urban song sparrows actually sang more and not less soft songs, and they actually sang fewer but not more <laughs> loud songs. Okay, that was contrary to our prediction. So soft songs still actually seems to be the preferred method of signaling, even in urban birds uh, who are more regular aggressive, and you kind of expect them to sing more soft songs because they're more aggressive. But um, that's, that suggests that the soft songs are actually still an effective signal, okay? Uh, uh, and in fact, this is what, the, what this graph shows. Uh, so in the, in the rural habitats and the urban habitats, the attackers, which is uh, whether they attacked or not here on the x-axis, the attackers actually sang a higher proportion of uh, soft songs compared to the non-attackers, okay? And, uh, soft songs were still a very reliable predictor of attack uh, amongst both the urban birds and the rural birds. Notice only four uh, rural birds actually attacked the uh, speaker or the, the mount. Uh, a lot of uh, urban birds actually attacked. Okay. So how does this work then? How does how do they actually uh, are how are they able to uh, still signal uh, with soft song? Well, one possible strategy is that uh, they might actually use soft song, but they actually sing closer to the speaker. Okay. So what they did, uh, what, we, what I did here is uh, basically I uh, pulled out how, what the distance was every time they sang a soft song and a loud song. And it turns out that uh, in the urban habitats, they actually did sing uh, closer to the speaker compared to the uh, rural habitats when they sang a soft song. The difference there was uh, slightly less pronounced in loud song, um, 
it was still significant, but it's, it was actually less that there was less difference in the last song compared to the soft song. So this is consistent with the finding that urban birds are more aggressive. And uh, but because of this interference from noise, they actually have to come closer to the receiver to actually make sure that the signal transmits. Okay. And what about the multimodal shift? Do they actually switch to the visual modality? Well, what we found was the urban birds, in fact, gave more wing waves proportional to their overall signaling effort. Uh, so if you take the proportion of soft songs and wing waves and look at the proportion of wing waves in that uh, aggressive signals, they actually gave more wing waves in the urban habitats compared to the rural habitats. Okay. This is consistent with the multimodal shift. Okay. So they, in the urban habitats, they seem to be increasing their uh, visual signaling effort. Okay. So in summary, uh, urban birds were more aggressive. They approached the upon closer attack at a higher rate. Uh, the threat signals are still used. The threat signals of soft songs and wing waves are still used and they reliably predict attack. And there was uh, that what they do is uh, instead of not using the soft songs, they actually use it uh, in a, from a closer range. Uh, so they, they decrease the transmission distance, which of course uh, means that uh, they're at a higher risk of escalation. And they also increase uh, visual signaling effort by switching to this uh, visual signal of uh, wing waves. Okay. Now, what is not known from this study is uh, whether the receivers would actually perceive the soft song equally well in urban habitats compared to the rural habitats. So, even though we uh, hypothesize that the you know singing closer to the opponent uh, might actually uh, overcome the effect of noise or interference from noise. We don't actually know if the receivers are able to uh, perceive the soft song from the same distance, from, from that distance equally well in the urban habitats compared to the rural habitats. Okay? Um, the, that, that needs uh, additional careful experiments uh, to figure out uh, from the receiver's perspective. Now, um, despite the fact that they still use these signals and they might actually have some ways of uh, kind of uh, ameliorating the effect of uh, noise, uh, they might, they, they, the song sparrow still seems to be experiencing some communication breakdown because they have to still come closer and they, they still escalate this interaction more quickly uh, in the urban habitats. And this may be because of these ineffective signals. And uh, another piece of evidence for this kind of uh, effect uh, comes from another study uh, uh, in white crowned sparrows by uh, Jennifer Phillips and uh, Elizabeth Dareberry. They studied white crowned sparrows in, the, uh, in a city park in San Francisco. And uh, the, the city park is very large and some areas are very kind of uh, less noisy and some areas are actually very noisy, like in this uh, right by this highway. Uh, this is the Golden Gate Bridge. And this is actually a very noisy habitat, both from the uh, surf noise, the noise of the waves and from the traffic noise. And what they found was that in fact, uh, the approach distance uh, during the speaker, during the playbacks were actually dependent on the noise. And as the noise increased in a territory, they, the white crown spurs actually approach, <coughs> excuse me, white crown spurs actually approach the speaker much more closer. Okay. So this supports the idea that the, the, the noise actually uh, has an effect on, um, that the noise leads to communication breakdown and may actually increase aggression in the, in, amongst the urban bird. Now, this is a correlational data. Um, so yeah, we, we want to test the same idea in, uh, in other species closer to home. So what we did was um, we were running an experiment in great tits and we actually, um, for a different reason actually, but we also took these noise measurements during this experiment. And great tits is a great model system because uh, it's a very common urban bird, as I said earlier. In Eurasia, it takes to cities very well. It's actually very adaptable. Uh, it will nest in uh, nest boxes, which also is a very convenient thing because you can study these, their breeding behavior in, much, in a lot of detail, as Ernji knows. And um, you can also uh, do a lot of experiments with them. Okay? So they're very tractable. Okay? So what, what we did was we tested the great tits breeding on campus of Middle East Technical University in Ankara. And this is the uh, this is kind of a, uh, the the map of the uh, camp campus in uh, Middle East Techn Technical University, and these are all the dots uh, of the Great Tits territories. Um, so these are the red dots are actually in uh, directly adjacent to buildings, and the green dots are in the wooded areas that are less noisy. Okay, so. Um, there's actually even within this campus, which is actually not you know it's pretty large big campus, but it's not not large uh, in terms of the 
how 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 wide the grade tits are spread. Uh, there's actually a lot of variation in terms of noise uh, that the grade tits are experiencing. Okay. So we measured aggressive behaviors and noise in this uh, in these uh, territories, and this was actually a collaboration with a, a bunch of study, students. Um, Khan and Dilan. Uh, Khan was an undergraduate uh, with us uh, in Koch University. Dilan is a PhD student at Koch University, and Aljan is a uh, Aljan is a master student in Middle Technical University, uh, studying with Jan Bigel. So this was a true collaboration and. So we measured uh, close approaches, close approach flight rates and time spent by within five meters, and we put them together in a uh, principal component analysis to get a composite aggression score. And when you're doing this research in uh, Middle East Technical University campus, you also get these additional field assistants occasionally, um, which are uh, you know nice, but sometimes they're actually uh, kind of a nuisance because they disrupt the experiment. Um, okay. um, but anyways. Okay, so what we found was that uh, uh, in fact, it's like as the noise increased in the on the campus uh, territories, the aggression scores actually increased as well. Okay, uh, and in in this uh, um, uh, approaching it closely, more closely. Okay? So there was a uh, uh, correlation between ambient noise and uh, aggression on the territory. But uh, interestingly, ambient noise did not actually correlate with the signaling behaviors that we measured, uh, like song duration or song rate. Okay. What we found was uh, the more aggressive birds uh, sang less. So the great tits don't have a signal like soft song. They actually don't have this uh, signal that the song sparrows have. But what they, excuse me, what they instead seems to be doing, seem to be doing is they basically stop singing altogether when they're really aggressive. Okay. And the most aggressive guys were actually the ones that actually sang nothing, no, no, no songs during the trial. Yeah. So, which is, if you think about it, it's the extreme soft song, right? You know, uh, if you took the soft song, uh, the length amplitude to zero, that's basically what you would get, no songs, right? Anyway, so it might, it, it may be sort of a similar idea of decreasing the amplitude of the of the signals to as you get closer to the uh, receiver. Okay, so um, this is actually very suggestive. Both the white current square data and our weighted data suggest that the noise actually drives aggression in urban birds, but it is still correlational data, right? And this noise, uh, th these correlations are very suggestive, but they, there's actually a lot of different variables that correlate with noise, uh, such as you know, uh, visual pollution or chemical pollution or difference in food availability, density of territories, et cetera, right? So it will be ideally to uh, good to identify noise as a causal factor. And you can only do that uh, if you actually have an experimental design where you experimentally increase the noise, okay? So um, this is what we did uh, in another experiment. Uh, and this experiment we did with uh, European robins because uh, there's actually a lot more European robins in Istanbul uh, than great tits uh, in the city parks. Um, so what we did was we tested the urban and rural robins in Istanbul and uh, in, in the rural areas in Istanbul, forested areas in Istanbul around this and robins are also nice because they also have they have both vocal signals uh, such as song and actually they had, they do have a kind of a soft song type signal called twitter song and they also have visual threat signals uh, such as wing waves uh, this neck display where they will display this red next red uh, feather uh, red red feathers on their neck and then they also have this uh, behavior called swaying which is basically they fixate upon the point and then they just basically just do this which sounds very, which looks very psychopathic when you when you actually watch them do it. But I don't know what the purpose of that is. But it's a it's a aggressive thing. Okay. So it's actually good for uh, testing the multimodal shift hypothesis. Um, we tested each bird twice, uh, once with noise and once without noise. So this this is where we actually experimentally uh, induced uh, acoustic noise, and this was actually a study by uh, led by Charles Ayansal, who's a, a master's student at Coach with me. Me and a uh, collaboration with IPA in Nashville, who is actually an undergraduate, uh, about to graduate. <clears throat> so, this is their study, really. Okay. And uh, we had several predictions. Um, well, the first prediction is that the urban robins will be more aggressive than rural robins. Uh, the second prediction was that uh, experimental noise will increase aggressiveness of the birds. And the third prediction was that uh, with the experimental noise, uh, birds will tend to switch to the less noisy modality, in this case, the visual modality, and use more visual threat signals. What we found was uh, urban birds were indeed more aggressive than the rural birds. If you look at this graph uh, on the x-axis, we have um, 
we have these are the rural birds and these are the urban birds uh, and this is control versus noise uh, in each trial and this on the y-axis we have aggression score and higher scores means higher aggression okay and as you can see there's no real difference with urban birds and the rural birds urban birds are more aggressive than the rural birds okay but uh when you uh, look look at the effect of noise uh, compared to control versus noise condition uh, the effect was habitat dependent in that the rural birds became more aggressive under noise, but the urban birds actually showed no consistent effect. Um, they, if anything, they became slightly less aggressive, but uh, it wasn't significant. Okay, so there was a two-way interaction between habitat and condition. And uh, keep in mind that the urban urban habitats were already noisier than the rural birds. So the additional effect of the additional noise that we put out there with the speaker may not have as much effect as the uh, as it did in the rural habitats. Okay. Uh, what, uh, when you look at the singing rates, uh, urban, uh, urban and rural birds both uh, increase their singing rates in response to noise, uh, which means that they might be actually trying to increase the serial redundancy, basically singing more uh, such that at least one of those songs actually gets through. Right, um, and that might actually be a strategy to uh, make sure that the signal gets through to the receiver. Okay. However, uh, well, so when you look at the visual signals, uh, we found that the urban birds actually use more visual signals than rural birds, which is consistent with the multimodal hypothesis. But what we found was that the uh, Rubin, robins did not actually increase visual signaling under experimental noise. If anything, they actually signal. They actually signal less uh, with the noise in the uh, in the noise condition compared to the control condition. In the control condition, 100% of the trials had visual signals. In the noise condition, only uh, one of one out of four actually had uh, visual signals. Yeah. So this is actually contrary to the prediction of multimodal shift hypothesis. And that suggests that if there's a multimodal shift, uh, it's not due to individual level uh, plasticity. Uh, it might be due to longer term processes. Okay. So in summary, um, just to summarize the three studies that I've talked about, uh, we found that uh, urban habitats lead to higher regression in several song songbirds. Uh, we have talked about song sparrows, great tits. Uh, we also have another experiment in great tits um, that we haven't, uh, I haven't shown you uh, that shows the same thing, and European robins. And then we also have an experiment that I paired it with uh, common chaffinches that's also showing the same effect uh, that urban birds are more aggressive than rural birds. And that seems to be sort of, uh, uh, kind of a general pattern. Uh, different spe species seem to have different strategies when it comes to dealing with interference uh, from noise. Okay, so some of them actually, like robins, increase their singing rates. Uh, so, so, and song sparrows also increase their uh, soft song rates, uh, but they also increase their visual signaling effort more com compared to the uh, rural birds, uh, whereas robins don't seem to be doing that. Okay? And uh, great this don't seem to be responsive uh, to the noise uh, by changing their signaling rate at all. Okay, uh, but they may actually sing at higher pitches, as I saw, as I showed in the introduction. We di we didn't measure in these experiments uh, the song pitch of the of the uh, of the birds. So there's a lot of uh, questions uh, for future directions that we can ask. Uh, one of them is, uh, what makes an urban animal more aggressive compared to a rural one? Uh, uh, I focused on the effect of noise, but there's actually a lot of the other factors uh, that are that might be in play, and that is probably in play. Okay, uh, so there's, for instance, there are some studies that shows that chemical pollutants might actually drive uh, aggression in uh, in some songbirds, uh, like song sparrows. Okay, another study found that uh, if you supplement food in a rural area, those song sparrows. Uh, this was a study with song sparrows. Those rural song sparrows supplemented with food actually become as aggressive as the urban birds. Okay, does that mean that the urban birds have more food available to them? We don't know. Okay, so that's actually something that we need to look at uh, in more detail. Okay, and then there's also uh, a need for more comparative studies uh, because uh, even though I may have given the impression that uh, the urban animals are always more aggressive than rural animals, that actually is not always the case. Okay, in some species like the house finches that are found in uh, North America, uh, the urban birds are actually less aggressive than the rural birds for some reason. And we don't know why that is. Okay, there's different hypotheses about why that might be. Uh, for instance, increased food availability might select for, you know, a lower quality individual being able to survive in that territory and so on. But we don't really know uh, what what drives this pattern between species. 
Another future direction uh, that I'm really interested in is whether these uh, multimodal signals, signaling in multiple modalities, actually incre affords increased flexibility uh, in dealing with noise. And that's actually, as I said, a more of a basic science question about uh, how these animal communications systems are shaped by the environmental effects. Okay. The multimodal shift that I talked about is not the only way. Uh, uh, it should say it's not the only way. Um, uh, to uh, actually use these multiple modalities flexibly, right? Uh, there are other ways that multimodal signals may help. For instance, uh, they may increase redundancy of signaling. Uh, so they, they may not increase overall signal, right? But they may actually tight, more tightly couple their signals together uh, so that uh, these signals become grab the attention of the receivers better. Okay? So uh, these are some of the future directions that uh, we'll, uh, we hope to pursue in the future. But I'm going to stop here and Acknowledge my collaborator, Kenneth Sewell and Isha Virginia Tech. Alijan and Khan. Khan is now doing a master in uh, Berlin, uh, about to finish your master, his master's in uh, Middle East Technical University. Jan Begin is a professor at Middle East Technical University, and Chala is finishing her master's at Coach, and Alper is uh, finishing her master's at Coach. This uh, research was studied, uh, supported by Coach University and Virginia Tech and uh, Bagep Award uh, to me from uh, the Science Academy and uh, the, an award from uh, British Ornithological Union to Chala. Okay, so the Chala, Chala studies was actually supported by the British Ornithological Union. And with that, I think we have some questions, some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alar. I mean, you have kept to the time. You also did less, use less jargon because, I mean, there are social scientists among us or people from other disciplines so that, I mean, I was at least able to understand almost everything. So thanks for that too. And I think it's very important and very valuable that uh, social scientists and natural scientists, they can, they, they find some platforms like this to speak to each other and they increasingly get into interaction with each other. So thanks for that kind of contribution uh, to our seminar and to the, to the sciences in general as well. So um, with that, I think we can open up the floor for questions. We have a lot of time, like 15, 20, even 25 minutes perhaps. And um, yeah, who wants to start? Or yes, Haga wants to start. Hi, everyone. Uh that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know Thanks. much about birds at all, but I feel like I've learned quite a bit. So thank you for that. But um, as I understand, there, as you mentioned later on in your slides, there seems to be this uh, differing sort of findings regarding like sparrows having like singing softer songs versus like robins singing louder in contrast or potential um, like considerations about like whether this uh, increased aggression has to do with like food uh, competition, for example, as opposed to some other reason. What I want to understand is like when we say urban, I feel like it means, it, at least in the context of economics, for example, it can have very different sort of qualities to them. When we study, when you guys study urban versus rural, what kind of um, qualities are you looking for? Because Because I feel like if we're talking about different uh, qualities, it can either be that different birds react to same environment differently, or we're looking at different environments that have certain minor qualities that make that uh, relationship more endogenous, perhaps. Uh, yeah, great question. So urban really do does uh, mean different things to different people, um, and uh, especially di between disciplines, but also within disciplines, which is uh, kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. But so in biology, um, um, we Kind kind of uh, tend to focus on the biotic or the or the physical attributes of the environment, such as for instance how much permeable space there is, um, uh, how much green space there is, and how much you know tree cover there is, etc. Okay, and uh, you can quantify uh, these uh, variables from, for instance, um, from from images, Google images, for instance. Uh, you can quite quantify that very relatively easily these days uh, with remote sensing. And that can give you a kind of a, a sense of what the urbanization is, right? Well, of course there are, uh, that's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily capture the whole thing, right? Uh, some areas might be, might look very urban, but they may actually be, uh, uh, you know, uh, relatively quiet. For instance, uh, imagine an abandoned uh, shopping mall, okay? Uh, or the parking lot, which may have some shrubs. Um, there's not much traffic there anymore because there's no, you know, nobody comes there. It's actually very quiet, but it has very, very low permeable, very low uh, kind of permeable space. It's all, you know, uh, basically paved up, right? So uh, 
uh, and or alternatively, you can actually have a very urban place like the Hajj Osman uh, City Park, right? Where you know there's actually a lot of green spaces there, but it's actually a very very noisy. Depending on where you are in the park, it can be actually a very noisy habitat. Okay, and there's actually a lot of foot traffic. There's even you know uh, vehicle traffic inside the park, etc. Right. So the, all of these things uh, makes it really hard to quantify. Uh, what is an urban area and what's a rural area. Um, so far in these experiments that I've showed you, I basically just said, you know, if anything, everything is urban, if, if it's in the city, um, if it's not in the city, it's rural, uh, but you can actually definitely quantify that in a more fine grade manner. And for the uh, song sparrow work in the Virginia Tech, we actually have done uh, measurements on the permeable surfaces and how much, you know, uh, how much green space versus uh, paved space there is. And, um, you know, and found a difference there, but it is not a, it's not a, um, you know, discrete difference all the time or every time. Uh, just sense? as a minor check on, uh, do you have a personal inclination as to why the difference is as to whether that is due to urban versus rural, like that definitional difference, or do you genuinely believe different species of birds just di react differently? Well, I think there's, there is different species of birds definitely react differently. Uh, we don't know why. Um, uh, different. I mean, they, they. We know that there's uh, some uh, differences, for instance, with their with uh, in how adaptive. So first, by the way, uh, what I haven't uh, talked about at all is some species do not adapt to urban habitats well at all. Okay, so these are species that actually, at least to some level, adapt to the urban habitats. Right, uh, great tits and robins. You can find them in the cities very easily. Right, they actually prefer to live. Some of them actually prefer to live with humans, like for instance, house bears. Right. Other species avoid it, you know, at all costs, right? They, you won't, you will not find them in urban habitats unless they actually have a very large habitat uh, left. Okay, so great that you can find it in a in a very busy road, like a, on the median of a very busy road, like in Harvey Airport. You can actually go out and hear them if you can hear them over the traffic, right? But you know, you won't be able to find all the species there in a, in such a habitat. Okay. And that, that, that might have to do with, uh, there's some evidence that they might have to do with the behavioral flexibility and maybe the brain size of the species, average brain size of the species and so on. So for instance, crows are very adaptable to urban habitats, but you know, uh, less flexible species may not be as adaptable and so on. So uh, that's kind of an ongoing research right now. Uh, we don't really have a good answer to that. Okay. Uh, but for those species who do adapt to the uh, urban habitats, um, what the what are what what makes them more or less aggressive uh, is not yet uh, systematically studied uh, that well, so we don't really know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I think Denise has raised her hand. Denise, please. Yes. Hello. Thank you for this presentation and for the seminar series. Uh, I just wonder why. Um, uh, supplemental food may increase the aggression level of the rural at the rural areas. If I did not uh, misunderstand the statement, yeah, yeah uh, you you understood correctly. Yeah, uh, so supplemental food may just make it make the birds uh, in better condition. Okay, they are better able to feed themselves, and they have more time to defend their territory. They have more time to. Um, um, uh, engage in aggressive interactions and they are more willing to engage in aggressive interactions they're more they're heavier they're in better condition etc right so they're better well fed and um and, and that, that might make them more aggressive just because of that if that makes sense right so they're in better physical condition as a result of the supplemental food which i think in that experiment was uh mealworms so it's also high quality food uh lots of protein etc so um that that basically, you know, uh, they're not malnourished anymore. Uh, normally, in rural areas, if there is a food source shortage, they will be actually, you know, not. They don't. They wouldn't have the energy reserves to engage in a lot of aggressive interactions. But now they do yeah, with the supplemental food. If that makes sense. But then the receiver will be also more aggressive based on that, right? So it would be more costly to be aggressive because your opponent will be more aggressive, perhaps. What do you think about that? Potentially, yeah. So I mean, if the, if the receiver also will had access to the food, right? And this is the whole purpose of territorial, you know, systems. You actually have the primacy, primary access to all the resources in your territory, right? Assuming the opponent is an intruder who is trying to get a territory, they may not have yet have access to 
you know, high quality food because they don't really have the territory, right? So that might put you in a better advantage, a higher advantage uh, in defense against intruders. But it, your neighbors may still have higher, you know, the, you, if you're interacting with your neighbors, they might actually be in your in the same condition as you are. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Marjan, please. We, we can't hear you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. If you wish, you can write it down. Yeah, you can write it down. What about now? Can you hear now? me? Now yes. Can. So I was uh, wondering, like, for the uh, interactions that you check for the aggression, is it more like uh, only uh, interest-specific, or do you also check for the inter-specific? Uh, like aggression or interactions, because like when we uh, say like great teeth, as you said, and house squirrels and the other species are, can be like considered as urban adapters or also like urban exploiters. And maybe the aggression is, the behavior is, might be related to the uh, competition between the species and as also like, uh, let's say, their presence at the same habitat or not? Yeah, that's a uh, great point. So um, I haven't really tested heterospecific uh, aggression um, of any of these species. Um, and you're right. So if they're especially uh, using the same resource, or for instance, great tits might be using the same resource as blue tits or cold tits uh, in, the, in terms of the you know uh, nesting holes and so and then they might they, you might expect some heterospecific aggression between them, um, even though there's 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 going to be some size differences, obviously, right? And uh, in areas where there is a lot of uh, competition for the same kind of resource, you might actually get uh, these aggressive interactions between uh, different species. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the animals, uh, you know, songbirds and elder animals too, they kind of choose their battles, right? And uh, when they actually uh, have to defend their territory, the highest threat from uh, to that territory comes from conspecifics because they're not only going to use you know resources like food or space or nesting, nesting places, they might they are also threat to paternity, for instance, which is actually a very big issue, right? And uh, therefore, they may actually invest more into conspecific territory. You would expect them to invest more into conspecific defense compared to uh, defense from heterospecifics, right? Uh, or uh, from other species. But you know, that's not to say that that doesn't happen. And there's definitely uh, instances where heterospecific um, territoriality occurs. Okay. Yeah, I, we haven't tested whether that changes between urban, urbanization or not, but that would be a really interesting idea. Okay, we have lots of questions. There might be yes. done it then, please. Um. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting information. Um, I wonder, like, I mean, it's not directly related with your findings, but does this interference due to urban noise also affect the mating calls? Like, I mean, do they like maybe decrease somehow or is it at least expected to decrease um, the mating um, chances, let's say, due to the noise? Yeah, I mean, there's there are studies. Uh, we have looked at the female receiver uh, or the, the, how the signal changes uh, for the female receivers. But there are other studies, for instance, in great tits that show that the, uh, the low frequency songs, um, when they are, uh, when, you, when, a, when a male sings a low frequency song in the urban habitat, that's actually less effective uh, because it has a lower, yeah, um, basically, transmission range. And the females can't hear it as well. So there are studies like that that actually show that the females uh, don't respond as much uh, to the frequencies that are more masked by the urban noise. Um, with this white current spurs, there's also some evidence that the uh, narrow, so the, in the white current spurs, the urban birds tend to have narrower bandwidths in their uh, song uh, trills, and that seems to be a less attractive signal to the females. So that it does definitely affect the, the mating signals uh, that are directed to the females. Thank you. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> first of all, thank you for the presentation. 
Uh, I read somewhere, I remember that the, the frogs that live in the city ponds also started to use like different frequencies. And like there are, they are now um, finding that the urban mice have differences in their yeah. genomes. And like, I wonder what's your opinion about like in terms of the evolutionary perspective and biodiversity, because in urban environments, we always think that it will decrease the biodiversity, but I, yeah. I can, I'm sometimes like a little bit optimistic about that because I think that now we can live in the cities together with new species maybe, but what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very complex question, right? <laughs> but uh, you're right. So there, there, are, there is a lot of biodiversity in the cities and people are increasingly recognizing the fact that, um, I mean, Urbanization is inescapable. As I said, you know, 56% already of people already live in urban, urban habitats. The, the footprint of urban habitats don't end in the cities. It actually spreads to everything around the cities as well uh, because they have to be fed. They have to be, you know, there, there has to be infrastructure and, and so on. So, it, you know, it, urban habitats have actually a lot more influence uh, beyond the actual cities uh, that they the uh, the space that they occupy in the cities. Uh, so uh, it is it is therefore very important to kind of, in my opinion, to conserve and you know um, to promote as much as we can the biodiversity in the urban habitats. And uh, so I'm really getting more and more interested in that kind of uh, questions as well. And um, it really depends on how we live together, right? Um, you know, um, we have to be mindful about our impacts, uh, not just because of you know by you know human activities, but also why the with with the stuff that we bring with us, right? Uh, with all the all the pathogens, all the other species that we bring with us, including cats and dogs, for instance, that they might might actually because they are top predators and they will actually have a very kind of a, um, uh, important influence on the biodiversity in those habitats, right? Uh, all of these things. Uh, need to be thought about and uh, kind of taken into consideration, essentially. Yeah? And um, uh, and as a society, I mean, my personal opinion is I think promoting biodiversity in the urban habitats is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it's, a, it's not a blank check to just urbanize the whole planet, right? But we have urbanized a lot of the planet already, right? So, and we, you know, we can, we have, uh, I think, a duty to make it more habitable for wildlife, uh, given that. Okay. And of course, you know, we should conserve the remaining habitats, uh, of course, and that those are not necessarily kind of mutually exclusive goals. Okay. Thanks for that question. I mean, also very interesting from the social sciences perspective, I think. Yeah. Yes, Anju, please. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And in your one of your first slides, you explained nicely how birds can potentially respond to anthropogenic noise. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I believe singing sound louder or producing like in an adaptive frequency song should be energetically costly. Do we know anything about how this changes, how these adjustments can translate to physiology of the birds? Yeah, that's actually a, a really good question. Um, there, it's there's not a lot of research in birds about the physiological cost of singing, um, and what there is is mostly lab based, and um, it's really hard to compare those costs in the lab to the cost in the wild because, on the one hand, yes, there are costs to sing more and louder, uh, louder, and so on, and. And you know that potentially is meaningful and fitness, to, you know, influence and fitness, etc. On the other hand, the birds do engage uh, regularly in one activity that is super taxing physiologically, which is flying around, right? Uh, so they have to take their whole body and you know transfer transfer that body from uh, over over the air to somewhere else. So compared to that, you know, activity, um, not sure how you know it's not clear how much of the uh, singing is actually. Um, energetically costly you know that it, it might be defined margin margins that matter obviously right uh, but uh you know it, it, it is still kind of an answer, unanswered question i think for other species like for instance crickets and so on there's actually better uh better data on the physiological cost of uh acoustic signaling and increased rates of acoustic signal so there's actually a very good data on on those species uh, like crickets and um, um 
the cicadas and set, et cetera, right? But for birds, it's actually very hard to get that uh, data from a realistic situation. So, uh, but, but, but as a hypothesis, uh, you're right. So the uh, increased cost of, there might be an increased physiological cost of singing louder uh, or singing at different frequency, et cetera. Uh, there's also the kind of a fitness cost potentially from uh, singing louder in that they, they might make you, it might make you more conspicuous to predators, right? And that might actually uh, lead to uh, even more significant cost uh, in terms of fitness uh, in urban habitats, both because you have to sing loudly and become more conspicuous, also because all this noise might actually mask uh, predator cues that might that you might otherwise be able to detect, and therefore you, you're more you're more prone to get get a surprise attack by a sparrowhawk or something. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I think that Mark is with hands. In addition to what Hakan said at the beginning, and with Vilda's question, you elaborated a little bit. Is there any common uh, urban noise sources that maybe we can overcome more easily, or is there some strategies to integrate our urban noise um, suitable for these? habitats for these species or like, or is, is there any areas that maybe work on that? Yeah, I, I think the local, local governments like Istanbul municipality is actually working actively to decrease the overall noise levels and, uh, or at least manage them uh, such that they are less disruptive. So, um, and uh, so th there's definitely things to be done to, to limit that. So for instance, you can limit traffic in certain areas, uh, at least during the breeding season, for instance, and um, basically, uh, or you can limit, limit uh, activities like concert and so on uh, in the, uh, during the breeding season. Um, so there's definitely things that you can do. Uh, it, you know, your, the, the city life, you know, has to go on, right? It's really in, impossible to stop the city life, right? So you're not going to be able to stop the buses and the cars and so on, right? Um, but uh, which is the oftentimes the main source of uh, uh, noise. But there, you can limit the effect of noise uh, by some mitigation measures. Okay, maybe you know reduce traffic, um, or you know put up sound barriers and to limit the you know noise that is impacting the natural areas in the city and so on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, just uh, if there is no one with any question, I wanted to just, just say something. There is a series of documentaries uh, about like all of the animals that live in the cities from around the world. So if anyone is interested, I can share the name because I think it's like, it's a very good documentary. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Please do it. Like you can write it in the chat box if you wish. Okay, okay. For that. Yeah. Any other questions? Shala, I was wondering, I mean, very general uh, question, I think. I was wondering whether, uh, are there any differences when you do the field work in the US and in Turkey? I mean, okay, if you're working with birds or acoustic signals, what are some challenges and can you, because we have a lot of graduate students who are gonna work or who are already working in the field. So any recommendations right. you might have? Uh, good questions. Um, are there any differences? Uh, there, I don't think there are that many differences. I mean, you have to, I mean, I think the, the first thing is safety, right? You know where you're going and know what you might encounter and have a kind of good answer and don't be confrontational with people uh, as much as you can, right? Uh, so that's that, I think safety first is always the case. Um, in some areas in, uh, in, in Istanbul, for instance, I later uh, learned that some of the neighborhoods that we were trying to record weren't very safe. Uh, turns out, and you know, we were there mostly in the early or early morning hours. You know, after it gets light, so it was you know to record birds. So it wasn't necessarily like a very um, risky time to be there. Uh, but uh, if I had known what I know now, I would probably not take my students there. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, so basically, you know, do your research about where you're going and what you might encounter, and uh, kind of uh, mind be mindful of your and your of your safety and your students' safety uh, if you have people with you. And I think that's that's the same with everywhere. everywhere. Um, there are different risks, different kind of attitudes of uh, people towards uh, researchers. Um, I, I really had not 
had any kind of uh, negative interactions mostly for, uh, in, in Turkey, um, except maybe, you know, people are kind of suspicious and they might stop you and ask for permission if, if you have permission, etc. But, you know, I was, you know, the, in Turkey, it seems really weird because if you're recording with a video, they are really against it uh, in most of these parks and, uh, you know, in Baghdad Force, for instance, right? You have to get permission and so on so if you're recording video. If you're just recording sound, they're fine with it for some reason. Uh, you know, the, the, the security guys are always fine with it and they, you know, they're kind of interested and kind of amused by you, but that's about it, right? So I haven't really had uh, kind of too many aggressive interactions, but I would be, of course, mindful if you're recording with a microphone and, you know, don't hold it to someone's bedroom or something like that, you know, in, if you're in the city, that would be rude, right? So yeah, that, uh, that nothing else comes to my mind, yeah. But you know, working in cities, you have to be mindful of your safety as you 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 know as you work on in a in a city in the day. Okay. Any question or comment to wrap up? Anything you want to add to all that, perhaps? Well, that was great. Thank you for reminding me. Thanks for all the great questions, and I really enjoyed the talk. And thank I, you. <laughs> I really enjoyed giving the talk. <laughs> No, we enjoyed it more. So thank you very much. And uh, a brief announcement next time, I mean, next seminar will be at the end of uh, May. So it's going to be social sciences this time. Uh, but we're going to announce it soon. And uh, a special thanks for our, to our graduate students and for all the participants who came here. I mean, not uh, <laughs> who participated uh, online. So and we look forward to some perhaps face-to-face -face meetings in the coming future, let's see. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Alar. Thanks, and thanks, Blair. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.